Ready? Got open man. DJ Moore. End zone. Touchdown. Touchdown Bears. I am Jeff Joniak. Blitz is on. <laughs> Down he goes. Brusker. What was it like playing for Coach Dicka? Uh, I don't want to answer any questions like that. Pressure coming. He's in big trouble. Down he goes. No. Montez Sweat. No way. And pick it up. And pick it up. And pick it up. Now, Bears Etc. Brought to you by Miller Lite with the voices of the Bears, Jeff Joniak and Tom Thayer. Well, cut down day in the NFL is a very personal matter. Tough day for a large number of players who go through a wide range of emotions from the expectation they might be let go to absolute shock. This episode 88 of the Bears Etc. podcast is brought to you by Miller Lite. Assistant GM Ian Cunningham did an interview with the 33rd team balancing uh, the excitement of the final 53 in the season and 37 guys that essentially Tom Thayer would be getting fired. 16 could be back on the practice squad. It's not fun. He was released. You've been cut before. It's the toughest conversation you have to go through. But at the same time, you're excited for the season if you're in the front office. Uh, so it's a weird feeling in the building. Can you relate to all that emotion right there? You know, the incredible sense of accomplishment when I was with the Chicago Bears was leaving Platteville, Wisconsin, and looking at the campus in your rearview rear view mirror and thinking, okay, I got over the first hurdle and I made the football team. But the head coach will come into the room after that 53 assembles for the first time, and they're going to give the speech, and everybody gives it, and the same speech every year is, look, this is not a finished product. This is not a finished roster. So if you think you've made the team for now and forever – and you don't continue to work, we'll look to replace you. So there's always a little bit of apprehension with the good news of making a football team, but there's a certain sense of accomplishment when you walk out of training camp and you've kind of earned the opportunity to have a position on a football team. Uh, the practice squad will be uh, put together, uh, announced later on Wednesday, uh, among the cuts, and we're not going to go through each and every one. Is there anything that sticks out to you? I'll jump in right away before you give a... Give us your thought, but not a surprise, but I, I would have really loved to find a place for Reddy Stewart, the young cornerback. Uh, my guess is he'll be on the practice squad. Micah Baskerville has done a nice job, both as a linebacker, but the Bears are really strong at linebacker, and uh, he's a very good special teams player. And then at the tight end position, uh, Steven Carlson, Brendan Bates, th those are the areas that I was going to look at. But again, it's a numbers game, Tom, because it's a matter of how many offensive linemen you want to keep, how many defensive linemen you keep. Those are the big numbers right there. Yeah, you know, uh, guys like Stroman who have had some game action understand what a contributor is on special teams. He's a multi-talented kid and can, can play a couple different positions. Uh, Carl Jones Jr., I thought it was a guy that put some uh, ability on display in the Hall of Fame game and throughout training camp. He runs really well, but maybe he's the type of guy that can come back to a practice squad. Brendan Bates, like you mentioned, I thought he really had a chance to make this football team. And if he doesn't get picked up by somebody else, maybe he will, uh, you know, come back to the Bears because he's definitely a guy that I would like to invest some time, some coaching, some weight room, some dietitians in because I think he could grow into a quality tight end. And we know how many injuries there are in that position. And I'm confused about the quarterback position. You got rid of Rippin, you got rid of Reed, and so you have two guys on the roster. Who is that third guy going to be? Do they target a guy with as on another roster on another team that they feel can come in here and fill the void, or do they still have one of those two guys as a candidate come here and be that practice squad quarterback? Yeah, there's a possibility both could be on the practice squad. The, the veteran influence and the young developing quarterback and Reed. Um, so a lot of folks are wondering what was going to happen with Velas Jones. He kind of always want. He left me wanting more because when Valus Jones Jr. came aboard the Chicago Bears, we knew that he was a mature guy coming out of college. He was older than most of the guys. He had some really good qualities about him in terms of side speed, a thick body, but. You know, when, when they gave him an opportunity as a wide receiver, he never came up with a big catch. When they allowed him to be a punt returner, he made more, you know, fumbles and drops than he did good secure catches. And we all know what the return game wasn't last year, but what it's becoming this year. And there's a lot of body styles that are changing in the returner. And another running back, I don't think it's just a plug and play type of position. I think you need to develop the instincts and the sight lines of a running back that can really help you, uh, 
turn the corner or become the running back that's expected of you, especially at this level? Well, one of the guys I'm super happy for is Daniel Hardy. He makes the football team, uh, at least right now, with Montez Sweat, Austin Booker, Demarcus Walker, Daryl Taylor, Dom Robinson, and Daniel Hardy. Uh, Daniel really put forth uh, some great tape this preseason, uh, was one of the NFC leaders in sacks with three and a half. I know it's just preseason, but he had to play that way to make this football team, and he did. He hustles. The guy hustles, and he can play special teams. You know, and I kind of I'm glad you said that because the first thing that comes to mind when you talk about Daniel Hardy is Israel Adonage. Israel Adonage was a guy that kind of could play up and down the defensive line of scrimmage, but he is one of the greatest contributors on special teams of all big guys that I think that I've ever been around. And I know kickoff coverage has changed a lot. But Daniel Hardy has the size, the athleticism, the escape ability, the tackling ability to go out there and be a, a contributor at that position and probably on punt team on the interior as well. So I that's the one thing about Daniel Hardy. He created his own opportunity because when Jacob Martin got hurt early in training camp, that kind of moves everybody in that line up one person. But, I mean, how do you react to that advancement in that line? Do you – duck your head in the sand and hope you don't get seen? Or do you raise your hand like the smartest kid in the class and provide the right answer every time? And that's exactly what he did. And Martin, he, he will be on IR with a chance to return as he uh, continues his rehab. Same story for Larry Borum at offensive tackle. Others on the injured reserve list, Simba Webster, Dante Pettis. Uh, do we, do we, one thing to interrupt you, do we know the story of Colin Johnson? He's been uh, he's been cut. Yes, so okay. he 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 could be signed back to the practice squad. He could be signed and, back to the you practice know, squad. You know, he would be the type of guy that um, if I felt if through a training staff, that he's the type of guy that could ha- stay healthy for the long term. Then I would possibly bring him back on the training camp because I know that he didn't contribute until late in the season last year. And if that's the guy you always need waiting in the wings when conditions deteriorate and maybe you start running the ball a little bit more, he is a good blocker from the wide receiver position. Yeah, so right now, wherever you want to categorize Valus Jones, maybe just as a utility man, there's six wide receivers on the roster, and they all are unique in their own way, obviously, with more Allen Adunze, Tyler Scott, DeAndre Carter, who has a good chance to be uh, the punt return man or the kickoff return man or both, and Valus Jones. Uh, the corners, heavy, heavy corner, all of them can play. Jalen Johnson, Tyreek Stevenson, Kyler Gordon, Terrell Smith, Jalen Jones, Josh Blackwell, all play roles. There will be several of those guys that are impact players on special teams, and it gives you a lot of depth at all three of those cornerback positions, including nickel, Tommy. Probably the most important position to have depth on in the modern-day NFL of any other position that you can talk about. Mm. Because to me, cornerback outside of quarterback is the most difficult position in the NFL to find talent. And when you talk about those number of guys that are that talented, if there is any type of hiccup with injury during the course of the season, you have a plug-and-play cornerback that's difficult to find. Jeff Joniak and Tom Thayer with you here on Bears Etc. Episode 88. It's brought to you by Miller Lite. Tastes like Miller time. Celebrate responsibly. Miller Brewing Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. 96 calories and 3.2 carbs per 12 ounces. Okay. Take me back to your time, what that moment is like from your own experience and what you've heard from others over the years when they do get that call or when you were called into Coach Wanstatt's office and you know what, we're going to move on and you landed with the Miami Dolphins. Um, What was your personal emotion? Um, Such disappointment, uh, such failure, self Mm. self failure. Um, I was coming off a back surgery and I did, I probably didn't live up to what the expectations were of Tony Weiss, the offensive line coach and Dave Wanstead and that, you know, growing, going with a younger group of guys. I hold no grudges before because of that. The difference is they always used to get a, you get a phone call from the secretary and Mary called me up and she said, Tom, coach Wanstead wants to see you and bring in your playbook. So there I carry in my 300-page playbook that's in a binder Mm. that after you give it to that secretary, you know exactly what's coming next. Nowadays, they just whitewash you from the tablet, and you're not carrying anything (laughs) in with you. So the difference in the modern day uh, trimming down the roster is different than the old school trimming down of the roster. But like I said, um, I was proud of what I accomplished with the Chicago Bears. I held no grudges. By the time that uh, I was cut, 
um, I got home and I already had calls from four teams that w- wanted me to fly in for a tryout. Washington Redskins being one of them. Redskins at the time. Miami Dolphins being one of them. And Miami Dolphins needed help immediately. And so when you think about the fantasy of playing on a football team that's not in the Midwest, that you see these players that are tan all year round, <laughs> I was going, wow, that may be a chance to explore uh, the AFC passing game football that I'm not really familiar with from playing in the NFC. So I went down there and had a great opportunity to play there for a year. But the that initial call that you get when the secretary's on the other end of the phone, it kind of gives you that nervousness in the pit of your stomach, whether you get a call that, hey, the doctor wants to see you, or hey, your principal needs to see you, or the dean of students needs to see you. It's one of those calls that gives you an immediate you know, queasy feeling in your stomach. And it did. I was 33, 32 years old. And I felt like I was being called into Dean Rhodes office at Joliet Catholic. Mm. There's a great article in the, the Tribune on a Tuesday of my Brad Biggs. He repurposed a story he did a long time ago with Jeremy Snyder, a friend of ours who used to work yeah. in the Bears uh, video department and now in the uh, scout for the Canadian Football League. And uh, he was the, the Turk. And guys would hide. <laughs> they try to find vet- veterans that may have known it was coming. You couldn't find them, but he had, they had to find them. It was a face-to-face thing. It wasn't yeah. a phone call. You had to face them face-to-face. So uh, just extraordinary uh, stories indeed. But- and I'm certain it's not that way now. And it's more of a congenial conversation and, you know, come to the office and here we go. Jeff, back in our day before the invention of cell phones and text messages and emails and that type of contact, you could hear a faint knock on the door door. in the Platteville dorm room at 5 o'clock in the morning, at 5.30 in the morning, and it would be the Turk of that time would open the door and say, hey, coach wants to see you. And you'd see that poor guy walking down the hallway with his playbook in hand and then coming back to his dorm room, no playbook in hand and with the door open inside their packing. And that's one of the most difficult things is friendships before cuts, because you don't necessarily make friendships before cuts because you don't want to become close to a person that you're either competing against or you kind of feel that they're going to get cut. And because that instant in time, that instant of, uh, you know, you're not, you're, you are on your way to adulthood, but you're still trying to compete to play a sport. And it's a, it's a tough couple minutes. Bears, etc. is brought to you by PNC, official bank of the Bears, and Vizzy Heart Seltzer. Flavors for every vibe. Celebrate responsibly. Molson Coors Beverage Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Okay, let's take a look at the roster now. First of all, it's bigger, it's bigger, it's better, it's faster, it's deeper. Would you agree? 100%. Uh, you know, and you, you, okay, what's what's bigger, what's better, what's faster? The wide receiver position is faster. Defensive backs are fast. The linebacker position is going to play faster because now they have experience, Tremaine Edmonds and TJ Edwards. And so those guys are going to play a faster brand of football along with Jack Sanborn and the rest of the crew. The defensive line is bigger. When you look at Javon Dexter, you have what you have in Billings. You have what you have in Montez Sweat. He's a big man. And you the rest of the the crew that's going to fit in uh, defensively, how they're going to fit in. Offensive line, Darnell Wright is a big man. So is Braxton Jones. They have some uh, size on the inside with Tevin Jenkins and hope you get consistency at the right guy, right guard. And you have Coleman Shelton right now at the center position. Uh, the tight end position is big with uh, Mercedes and, uh, you know, Cole and the rest of the, Gerald Gerald Everett. Everett, the rest of the crew there. Matt so, Pryor on the offensive line, a big yeah, man Matt, who can exactly. play three positions. Huge man, big, big man. And, uh, you know, the running back position's quality. I think DeAndre Swift is a great addition to this group of guys that came in here and made the position even more competitive. We always talk about players, but let's talk about the coaching staff. I think uh, Matt Eberflus is in the right pre- sweet spot right now for him. He's the head coach of this football team, but he's also going to be calling defensive plays, and that's where his heart is. He, he just feels like – it feels to me anyway, not, not from his mouth. These are my words. It just feels – this is right in his wheelhouse, okay? And he's managing the situation. He's got 25, 26 assistant coaches on this staff to help him out. And then you got the offensive coordinator, Shane Waldron. He's impressed us both, not only is in, in his demeanor, 
his understanding and explanation of what he wants to do, but also in what he's called, at least in the preseason, balance. Yeah, you know, one thing about Matt Eberflus, since he took over play calling last year, it's undeniable the defense got better. And whenever you have the head coach that's making the calls on defense, you have a certain, uh, you capture the player's attention with a little bit more seriousness. I think the addition to Eric Washington, defensive coordinator, is a great addition to the intelligence of the staff. He's a really good person. He relates really well to these football players, and they have a lot of respect for him. Not to, And that's all the other assistant coaches on defense as well. Matt Eberflus is also a good influence on a young quarterback because he knows exactly what a defense is trying to do to defense against the quarterback they're playing against. And so that relatable message to a young quarterback like Caleb Williams is super influential and and educational in the development stages. And listen, I don't know Shane Waldron very well yet, but from what I've seen out of him and the way he calls the game in training camps and the, and the training camp games and in practices itself, and when you look at the balance and the inclusion of everybody – I'm super excited to see where this regular season is going to go in the first uh, portion of the season. Tastes like Miller time. Go to MillerLite.com slash Bears Pod to find delivery options near you. Celebrate responsibly. Miller Brewing Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 96 calories and 3.2 carbs per 12 ounces. So the owners passed a new rule that would have allowed a third quarterback to be elevated from the practice squad an unlimited number of game days. Uh, so the NFLPA rejected that. So the proposed change of a quarterback emergency rule was tabled. So that impacts what you do now with the roster. So Brett Rippon, for example, had 131.4 quarterback rating in the preseason. Looked great in can, looked very, very good, and is a veteran guy that can ha- provide some help in that regard. So if you're going to choose to dress a third quarterback on game day, you, you got to keep him on the active roster. Now you can be elevated off the practice squad but you can only be done three times on game day. So how do you feel about this rule? Obviously, it's about money. Uh, the the uh, union would like to pay a third quarterback, but this would have been a good move for the entire NFL given how many quarterbacks the league has gone through the last two years. One of the dumber rejections of a smart rule I've heard in a long time in the NFL, and I'm and you know me, I don't agree with a lot of these changes, but you know, just to analogize baseball, do you like to see a position player come in and and throw batting practice when no. they're right? Okay, so that's the same thing with football. Do you want to see a, a clever wide receiver or a running back or whomever take over at the quarterback position if you have multiple injuries? So you have this third guy that's sitting on the sideline. And how about this? Put him on the roster. If he doesn't play in the game, you pay him whatever his practice squad salary is. If he does play in the game, then you elevate that week's check to a game day check. Hmm. Listen, Jeff, That's a good you idea. need multiple quarterbacks on the game day roster. And like the rule says, once you put him in the game, they're there to stay. So... Uh, again, just a just a dumb decision. I think that's failing the game day roster of the NFL. So let me say this about because people have asked me that you know don't know all the intricacies of the salary cap or whatever, what a, what a paycheck is for a practice squad player. So the minimum salary is twelve thousand five hundred a week. If you have two years experience, the minimum is sixteen thousand eight hundred per week. Maximum salary twenty one thousand three hundred per week. So over an eighteen week regular season. If you are on the practice squad, and if you get elevated three times, uh, your salary, you don't have to be elevated three times, but your salary is anywhere between two hundred and twenty-five grand and $383,400 annually. More than I ever made. I mean, I right? I got on the practice squad, never worried about playing in the games, go out there and give my great uh, padded effort one day a week for 14 weeks and get paid that salary. That's pretty handsome. And so, uh, yeah, I mean... I, I, listen, it creates a lot of incentive for these guys to go out there and put in the same off-season effort in the same seasonal effort to make the practice squad as you do to make an active roster. Uh, a couple of other things. Uh, since the 22 quarterback class uh, was selected, <clears throat> there's only two players left on their original teams at quarterback. So pick number 247. Skylar Thompson of Miami and pick 262, Brock Purdy of San Francisco. Malik Willis traded to the Green Bay Packers, number 86. So this is the status of quarterback play. 
2021 wasn't a heck of a lot better in terms of that too. So you really are swinging for quarterbacks, much to your point about the rule. Uh, this league is thirsty for quarterbacks. And that and, and three deep would be nice. It's Well, it's one of the most difficult positions to scout along with cornerback because you don't know on cornerback if athleticism is going to compute to what you need in order to perfect the sport, the position. Same thing with uh, quarterback. So from cornerback to quarterback, from what the college day offers these guys nowadays, they hold up a poster on the sideline. They look to the sideline. Everybody gets their assignment. The quarterback claps his hands and they run the play accordingly. The terminology that you have to master as an NFL quarterback and then how it relates to vision and then how it relates to decision-making and then accuracy. It's such a difficult position to scout because if you think of some of the guys that were less than caliber athletes of the Peyton Mannings or the Tom Brady's or the Dan Marino's that ran a five plus 40 and now you get these guys that ran a five four four forty you think that's going to compute to being a great quarterback that's just not the case we are brought to you by pnc official bank of the bears all right tom i uh gave you a homework assignment uh camp balls you're the best you're the king of the camp balls we used to give those every day during training camp so i asked uh you to do some homework here so camp ball on offense this year and then we'll hit defense and special teams you go first Okay, uh, and, and I know it's going to disappoint you so much, but I, I have a lot of joy in this. And it's, yeah, Caleb is the easy choice. But my offensive camp boy ball is going to Coleman Shelton. And I'll tell you why. Stop it, it'd be yeah. easy to go to, uh, you know, to Caleb Williams, obviously. But to me, Coleman Shelton has done the most for this offensive line than any other offensive lineman has. Uncertainty at the quarterback position, uncertainty at the center. Now, after Ryan David, Ryan Bates had to go over and play right guard a little bit, then Coleman Shelton came in and played center. He gave consistency to the position, consistency to the rhythm of the offensive line, the responsibility of understanding how to call out all the protections when you approach the line of scrimmage, and then how to change the protection response Responsibilities if the quarterback has to change play during the cadence and then just giving the quarterback some veteran leadership of a guy that knows how to play the position. So Coleman Shelton, come on down. Yeah, I like it. Why, why wouldn't I like it? He played 17 games for the Rams last year. He he's, knows this system very well. Mine's going to go to Keenan Allen uh, because his reputation preceded himself and it was everything I thought it would be. He's a magnificent route runner. He creates separation. Uh, as well as anybody ever has, and he made players on the other side of the ball better. I, I thought we saw Jalen Johnson elevate his game because of Keenan Allen. Keenan Allen gave him props too, and so I thought the whole iron sharpens iron thing, that was that was a no-brainer for me, Keenan Allen, and I think as camp wore on, he got better and better every day, gave full effort throughout training camp. How about the defensive side of the ball? I'm going to go with Daniel Hardy. And this is why he's another guy that they had, he had multiple bodies in front of him and he was in the back of the line, not in the front of the line. Now he's still in the line. And if that's what you want to accomplish at the end of training camp, there's nothing more gratifying than taking a former basketball fl- player that puts skills on display and then repeats that performance every training camp game. Then they have a team come in and he does equally as well on one-on-ones against the Cincinnati Bengals in practice and then carries it out to the game field. As soon as there's someone that's injured in front of you in the sport of profession in professional football, especially, how does that next guy in line do? Do you have to go out there and look for another body, or is that guy filling the void? And Daniel Hardy, congratulations. On the defensive side of the ball, I'm going to go with Jalen Johnson. Uh, the leadership aspect is popping for him. He has the ear of those guys in the secondary, and as that goes, as he goes, they go. And I think his emotion spreads, his confidence, his cockiness, not in a negative way, in a positive way, believes in himself more than anybody else in the world. He looks in the mirror and he likes what he sees. I think that spreads throughout a football team. Special teams. You know, the easy choice would be Tory Taylor. Yeah, that's There's my choice. Upon that. Well, I'm not taking him. <laughs> okay. Uh, but, uh, you know, the my guy, though, is Josh Blackwell. Yeah, I would be. Because... He's another guy that plays every special teams. He could be the special teams captain every week. He makes big open field tackles. 
He's a every every team contributor outside of being an interior lineman on the extra point and field goal block. So Josh Blackwell, a guy that's coming to the NFL and now he's made it multiple years because he's a top special team performer. Come on down, Josh Blackwell. You're getting the practice. You're getting the <laughs> you're, special teams ball of camp. What are you? Let's make a deal. Uh huh. I like it. I like it. Uh, the reason Taylor, uh, not just because of his reputation as uh, just an outstanding punter, great leg. Here, you heard the kicks. You heard the booms. The placement. The accuracy. He uh, led the NFC in uh, net average here in the preseason at forty-eight plus. Uh, so uh, that's just part of it. It's his personality. It's his ability to handle snaps, which. From a different long snapper than Patrick Scales w- required some adjustment. He managed that situation. In in weather, he managed that situation. So, Torrey Taylor didn't uh, play a lot of football until college. None, as a matter of fact. So, we're just starting to see the best of this player. I think he'll be a weapon this year. Best rookie at camp, and you can include Caleb Williams. Uh, you have to. I know some people are doing this exercise and excluding him, but uh, best rookie at camp. Best rookie at camp. Um God, you know, Brendan Bates, yeah. he's a guy. I, I like him. I know he's not here anymore. But um, I think he'll be on the practice squad. You know, uh, hopefully so. Hopefully so. I, I, I do like what I what I saw out of him because, again, you, we talk about the versatility of the tight end position, the multiple roles that they have to present themselves in order to catch catch the coach's eye. You know, hopefully he's going to be a guy that's either going to be in the NFL or he's going to be part of the Bears because I do think that he's got a a contributing future. Well, there's only so many 6'4", 255-pounders that run 4'6", and wants to hit you and and catch the football and, and, and railroad through you. And it can play special teams. That's what I'm saying. To hit yeah. you. Yeah. yeah I yeah. mean, yeah, yeah. I, I, I like that player quite a bit. And uh, you've heard me say it time and time again. Okay. Last couple things I'm going to hit was, was the kickoff return. Oh, I got to give you mine. So I, I'm picking Caleb. And, and here are my reasons. He's the real deal in terms of his per- – yeah. what, what we read, what we heard, what we, what we have experienced, more importantly, face-to-face, is what I'm going to take my evaluation on. First of all, he never flinched. Uh, he never will. I just, this man is never going to flinch. And that's why he has the potential to be great. He grew as a quarterback throughout this whole process. I think you would agree. Um, Never rattled by that aggressive defense. And I think they gave him an earful throughout preseason and training camp. Uh, He talked recently in an interview about competitive stamina, reaching out to various leaders in sports, um, sitting down with uh, Michael Jordan's, uh, trainer and, and good friend of ours, which we hope we can get on this podcast, Tim Grover, to find out what what was it about Michael? You know, he read about Kobe. He was more of a Kobe experienced guy at a younger age. Didn't get to watch MJ uh, firsthand, but th- those are those are decisions made by somebody who understands what he wants to be and he wants to be great. So I, I'm 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 going with that. And then the actual play experience, the efficient movements in and around the pocket. Uh, the instinctual awareness to see what's coming and and keep your eyes downfield to throw the football. Uh, I just, I still go back to this, the weapon way around you. Hopefully the offensive line stays together. If you just find first downs, the touchdowns are going to follow. That's right. Hey, listen, I'm I'm not disappointed by Caleb in any way, shape, or form. I think he's been a cool teammate. And as much as I didn't want to see hard knocks, I like to see a little bit of about the behind the scenes of Caleb Williams in practice and in meetings. So I think you went with some creative ideas. I went with the chalk, you know. The, 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 <laughs> oh, that's that's the kind of how we roll. Because you're a you're a you're a thinker. You're a thinker. All right, a gentleman by the name of Ted Wynn. He writes for the Athletic. Uh, did his own research since 2020. The average starting position after kickoff 25.2. This preseason, the average starting position was 27.9. Little improvement with the new role. Again, with no. Nobody's showing anything. Since 2020, only 14%, let's call it 15% of kickoffs were returned for 30-plus. In the preseason, it went up to 22%. And, and the thing he really realized is that speed on the back end, obviously ball security has always got to be number one, even on this kick return now, especially if there's going to be bouncing balls and pop-ups that are in bad weather and you happen to muff it. you gotta, you got to be on it. Speed is going to threaten that line of scrimmage a lot quicker. So you're going to see speed back there almost every time 
uh, with some variation in terms of guys can break tackles or just execute a running play. So it's trending in the right direction. Would you agree to these stats, albeit preseason, encourage you? Uh, yeah, I do. I like to see the kickoff return back in the game of football. But to me, if I was a special teams coach, the first thing I would do is put offensive linemen on my kickoff return because I think you can have more organized types of blocking plays. They're better blockers at the point of attack. They know how to sustain a block longer than defensive players do. And that's the thing about it is the proximity of the kick returner to where that confrontation takes place If you get an offensive lineman that can sustain a block maybe three-quarters of a second to a half a second longer, you're talking about the ball carrier breaking a play for distance. Now, if you try to repetitively teach a linebacker, a defensive back, to have a sustained block and something that they don't do for the process of their career and their job, they're just not going to be as familiar with it as offensive players were. So tight ends, offensive linemen, I would have them on my front line of blockers. Well, let me just ask you this question. There's always been a real hesitance in today in today's game to put starters on special teams. Would you have starting offensive linemen on special teams? I played fear, on kickoff return my whole career, Jeff. Okay, that, that's the answer to the if question. You're doing, if you're not doing something out of fear, then you know, you know that's that's super destructive. And I'm not saying that you have to use your starters on there. You know, you have backup tight ends, you have backup offensive linemen, and to keep those guys actively involved in the game yeah. is get them on kickoff return. Good idea. And then so so you so you create a, a you know we used to have a. a a blocking scheme and offense in on in college. We played a quick side and a strong side. So there was a year that I played quick guard. So that means I played both right and left guard, and I did a lot more maneuverability. And then you play strong side where there's a little bit more point of attack and a little bit more strength influence to that side. You can do it on as an offensive line and, and offenses back in the day. I think nowadays you can get equally as creative with, the types of blockers that you have available to you on kickoff return than any new part of the game. So you're telling me from play to play on a series, you'd go either right or left? Yeah. Wow. Then miss you up? Nope. Hmm. Strong side, quick side. Coming out of your stance, nothing. Right hand, left hand, none of that matters. right-handed stance all the time, even as a left guard. Did it tip off, though, what you guys might be doing? Was there a trend? If you Okay, that's... (laughs) I, uh-uh. Again, every time I talk to you, there's something new I learned. I never yeah. knew you did that. So that's pretty yeah. cool. Hey, we're brought to you by Busy Hard Seltzer. Flavors for every vibe. Celebrate responsibly. Molson Coors Beverage Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Coming up this week, we've got another edition of Bears, etc. Expecting to talk to veteran offensive lineman and now starting center, Coleman Shelton. And we've got also Bears Weekly coming up as well, as we'll take a look at the season opener a little bit. Uh, Take a look at the Tennessee Titans. We'll have a clear uh, vision of what the roster is, uh, at least in the first week of the season, and break it all down for you on ESPN 1000 of the Bears Radio Network. What do you got? You don't don't have to shy away from telling Coleman that I did pick him for my offensive player. Don't worry. I'm sure you'll tell him anyway. (laughs) You will tell him for sure. For Tom Thayer, I'm Jeff Joniak. Thanks for listening, everybody. Please subscribe now on the Chicago Bears official app, Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Bear down, everybody.